well, many questions about how the brain functions remain a mystery. Psychologists have made impressive discoveries about the status of sleep, language disorders, and many other psychological phenomena, like how perception works. But consider this. These discoveries would have been impossible without the tools that are now available to researchers. In this episode of Psych Boost, Ways of Studying the Brain. Two concepts I want to define first are spatial resolution and temporal resolution. Spatial resolution is how accurate we can be about the exact position of a brain structure or activity, whereas temporal resolution is about how accurate in time we can be about when the brain activity took place. The first way of studying the brain is the oldest. This is a post-mortem dissection. After death, brains are usually treated chemically or fixed to give them a firmer texture so they can be cut precisely. The brains chosen for dissection are often the brains of people who may have had unusual brains, such as people with mental illness, trauma to the brain, or have shown unusual behaviour in life. Their brain will be compared to what's called a neurotypical brain, or a healthy brain, and any physical differences could be linked to the behavioural differences. One of the most famous psychological discoveries made by post-mortem was by Paul Broca. He studied the brain of a patient called Tan. In life, Tan could only say Tan. So clearly Tan had issues with language production. When Tan's brain was studied in post-mortem, there was significant damage in the area of the brain in the frontal lobe, just above the temporal lobe. This area is now associated with the disorder Broca's or expresses aphasia. Understanding speech and knowing what to say or being unable to produce speech. The primary advantage of post-mortem is when it comes to spatial resolution. You can study the brain and its structures in microscopic detail even studying individual nerve cells. This is simply not possible with other techniques. However, post-mortem brain research suffers from a major disadvantage. These studies by their nature happen after death. There is no way of seeing the brain in action in this research. Even damage revealed in post-mortem may not be the true cause of the observed unusual behaviour. However, discoveries of abnormalities could lead to the generation of hypotheses that are tested with other measures. While much research is now conducted primarily on the living brain non-invasively, using other brain scanning techniques, I'm going to discuss here, the contribution of post-mortem dissection to our understanding of the brain is significant. The next method of studying the brain is the use of fMRI. fMRI stands for Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging, and you've probably seen images of these machines before, they're large, taking up an entire room, and a bed that retracts into a hole in the middle of the machine. It works by using large magnets to detect the blood flow in the brain. To be precise, it works by detecting the magnetic variations between oxygenated and deoxygenated haemoglobin. The more active parts of your brain need more oxygen, and these capillaries will be more open, and blood supply will increase in areas of activity. The area of activity can be displayed on an image, with colours representing areas of unusually high or unusually low activation. Red for high activation and blue for light. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of fMRI? Well, its major advantage is it creates a very detailed spatial image of the brain with a resolution of up to one millimeter. It can precisely identify regions of the brain that are highly active. The word functional means you can see how the brain is working and changing over time. This means you can get the patient to complete an activity while inside the machine and see how various brain regions respond. Another advantage is as it uses magnets to make images, it's safe for experiments. PET scanners or positron emission tomography, for example, uses radiation to get images and will be too risky to use in experimental research on humans. A criticism, however, is that while fMRI is precise in the spatial location of activity, it's less good at identifying the exact time of the activity. There is a delay of a few seconds between when the neurons activate and when the extra blood arrives at the neurons. And fMRI machines take an image every few seconds. This means fast brain processes like vision are less easily studied by fMRI. More disadvantages are that the machine is very expensive to build and operate, making experiments expensive. And you must be perfectly still in order for the image to be clear, and that limits what you can study, as you can't use experiments that require movement from the participant. The next way of studying the brain is the EEG, or electroencephalogram. And you've likely seen this cat before. You put it on your head and there's electrodes attached. 
There are normally around 22 to 34 electrodes and these are carefully placed across the device and make contact with your scalp. The readout for the device will be a number of patterns of activation in the form of lines, each line being the sum total of activity of the brain just under the sensor. The area under each electrode includes a large number of neurons. There are distinct patterns of brain waves that can be detected by EEG, such as alpha, beta, delta, and theta, and I'm going to talk about these more when we look at the stages of sleep. Looking at these waves, there is amplitude and frequency. Amplitude is how much the waves go up and down, and frequency is how close together each wave is to the next. So let's evaluate the EEG. Well, since its invention all the way back in 1924, it's been a very useful, non-invasive, non-surgical way to investigate the living brain. Used medically for the diagnosis of disorders like epilepsy and experimentally to demonstrate the stages of sleep. So it's had a big influence on our current understanding of brain activity. EEG machines can distinguish between different general patterns of brain activity. And as equipment, it's got the advantage that's significantly cheaper than other brain scanning techniques, costing thousands of pounds, not the millions of pounds that fMRI machines often cost. It's also portable, so you can use it outside the lab with subjects moving. It has fantastic temporal accuracy. So it measures the electrical activity of the brain in a resolution of milliseconds. You can see exactly the instant when the activity takes place and the activity immediately before and after. However, the primary criticism is a lack of spatial accuracy. The EEG can't identify the exact location of brain activity, only a sum of activity from a general region under each sensor. Also, it only detects activity on the cortex, the outside of the brain. Activity from deep within the brain just can't be detected from the scalp. And a practical limitation is it can take upwards of 30 minutes to carefully place the electrodes and conductive gel. ERP stands for Event Related Potentials. This technique uses similar equipment as the EEG, so electrodes attached to the scalp. However, the approach to the data produced is very different. Rather than just collecting the general activity across the brain, the researcher is looking for the response to a particular stimulus. To do this, the stimulus is presented hundreds of times. The brain activity wave is recorded each time. The data from all these is added together, and a technique of statistical averaging results in the brain activity that's not associated with the stimulus, that's just recorded by chance, which is called electrical noise, being removed. The data that's left is a smooth curve of activity called an event-related potential. This is the brain's response to just that stimulus. These complex waveforms can be interpreted in detail by the researchers, such as detecting exactly when certain cognitive processes happen in the brain after the presentation of the stimulus. When interpreting these waveforms, the peaks show positive or negative polarity and will be labelled P or N, often followed by a number which indicates how long after the stimulus the peak happens, for example, N100. When considering evaluations, the advantage of ERP over EEG is ERPs allow researchers to isolate and study individual neurocognitive processes in the brain. EEGs just give general brain activity. ERPs are now used commonly by cognitive neuroscience who study how sensory and cognitive information processing is linked to the physiological activity of the brain, bridging the gap between biological psychologists and cognitive psychologists. ERPs show with EEGs the disadvantages and advantages we discuss for EEG. In particular, the advantage are fantastic temporal resolution, with a sampling rate in milliseconds compared to multiple seconds between images in fMRI machines but they also have the significant limitation of very poor spatial resolution. A final evaluation to consider is the option of combining techniques. As fMRI and EEG-based approaches have contrasting strengths and weaknesses when it comes to their spatial and temporal resolutions, some researchers are using both EEG and fMRI, getting participants to first perform the same task first with EEG and then with fMRI then the results of both can be compared to get a deeper understanding of the brain's activity to the stimulus. Bonus fact about brain scanning. In a paper published in 2018, neuroscientists at the University of Washington demonstrated how they'd used EEG and a technique called transcranial magnetic stimulation to connect the brains of three individuals together by computer. Using this brain-to-brain -brain interface, 
they successfully played a game similar to Tetris, with two brains acting as senders of information, and the third acting as a receiver. As their brains were connected via computer, and they couldn't communicate any other way, this groundbreaking research could have long-term implications for the future of human communication. Are you tired of getting caught in class using Snapchat? Why not try direct brain-to-brain -brain computer aided telepathy? I've left a link to the research paper in the video description. It's open access so you can read it for free. I hope you found this Psychobus video useful. If you did, I've made more than 140 other psychology videos to help you with your studies, as well as a website full of free resources. If you want to help Psychobus grow, subscribe and like. Also, tell your teacher and anyone else you know who studies psychology about the channel. Thanks for watching. Keep studying.